Good morning. Please uh, turn your Bibles to Joshua and chapter 10. Joshua and chapter 10. I do trust that uh, by the end of the day, we would have uh, come out of our holiday hangover. Uh, some of us, it's written on our faces that we are still trying to know what happened uh, to the holiday that has ended uh, so soon. Uh, welcome to those that are joining uh, us uh, through Faith Radio and those that are joining us uh, through Facebook Live. Joshua and chapter 10. Joshua and chapter 10. The passage before us has all kinds of fears going on. In a sense, we humans don't know what to do with fear. Sometimes we completely want to squash off fear and to do everything in our power to get rid of fear. But fear is a human emotion. If you think about it, sometimes the reason for doing something is because you are afraid of A, B, C. And sometimes the reason for not doing something is because you are afraid of A, B, C. Early this year, I read an article that said, Obviously, this is quote-unquote a scientific article that said there are over 300 phobias, fears, in the world. And last month, I read another article that said it is impossible to name all the kinds of fears that people can have. And obviously, these days, everything is being categorized in, in, in some sort of section. The fear of what, the fear of what, the fear of what. Fear is a legitimate human emotion that must be stewarded well. In other words, we must fear what must be feared and not fear what must not be feared. And in most cases, we, we twist those two. We fear what must not be feared. And what must be feared, we actually do not fear. Observe with me the kinds of fears in this passage and the corresponding actions. And the very first point I want us to note is that the fear of man leads to fighting against God. What do we have here? We have, I'm going to take you back a little bit to chapter 9. We have the Gibeonites who heard that Joshua and the Israelites are marching on to conquer the promised land, the land that God has given them. And they are leaving no stone and tent. They are slaughtering nations. And so, the nations, if we read the chapters well, are gripped with fear. They are afraid of Joshua and the Israelites. And this fear of Joshua and the Israelites made the Gibeonites to deceive Israel so as to get in a pact with them, to make a covenant with them. Because they wanted to be safe. In other words, the Gibeonites reasoned within themselves to say, this is not a nation that we want to fight against. This is not a nation that we want to go to battle with. This is a nation that should be on our side, or rather, we should be on their side. And so that fear led them to deceive Israel, but we saw how God came in with his grace 
to them and to Israel. And this covenant was honored. We see another king, another tribe that is equally afraid of Israel. But instead of fleeing, instead of maybe doing what the Gibeonites did, this king, this tribe, takes a different course of action. So read with me uh, this one of chapter 10. He says, as soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. Take note of verse 2. He feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. And because it was greater than I, and all its men were warriors. So this king has heard what Joshua has done and is doing to the tribes in the land is about to conquer. Now, he's afraid. But something compounds his fear. And that is Gibeon, which in the description is a great city. A city that had warriors for its men. Has joined forces with Israel. And so he's now really afraid. And the Bible says he feared greatly in verse 2. If Israel alone has been doing this damage, what more now that they have joined forces with Gibeon? But observe what this fear led him to do. Verse 3. So, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jamuth, to Japhai, king of Lachish, and to Debai, king of Eglon, saying, come up to me and help me and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. So fear of Israel and Gibeon led him to making this pact, this alliance with the other tribes. And instead of taking on Israel, instead of taking on Joshua, they decide to take on Gibeon. Commentators say, well, he did this so as to send a message to the other tribes that if you try and behave like Gibeon, getting into a pact with Israel, you will see. They wanted to teach Gibeon a lesson so that the other tribes, the other kings, should not follow or imitate Gibeon. That's what his fear led him to do. But you see, he had missed something. He had missed the fact that Gibeon joining Israel meant that Israel would be drawn into this very battle. You know, it's like in those days, growing up in Chimwemwe, those of us who had big brothers, and the community knew that you had a big brother. And if your big brother lifted weights, he was a bodybuilder, had, had proper muscles in the right places, 
And the community knew. They knew that starting a fight with you as little as you were means drawing your big brother into the fight. So sometimes you'd misbehave and all they could do is warn you. You, you will see. We will deal with you. But no one actually wants to take a step to fight you because they know your big brother. But somehow, Adonai thought he could draw Gibeon into war and somehow Israel would not come to the rescue of Gibeon. Another commentator says, well, by fighting Gibeon, King Adonai wanted to send a message to Joshua as well. That if you try and make a pact with any of our tribes, with any of the surrounding kings, we will deal with you. But observe that the Bible says, he feared greatly. This is an action that was moved, ignited by fear. So Gibeon has been cited or drawn into war against all these powerful kings. And Gibeon knows he will not stand these powerful kings. They will crush him. And what does Gibeon do? He remembers he has a big brother. Gripped with fear, Gibeon was scared of what, was, of what was about to happen. And verse 6 says, And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Giga, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up as quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. He sends SOS to Joshua. We are in trouble. And you have to come quickly and help us. And we shall describe to you what we are fighting against. It's not one tribe. It's not one king. We are fighting against all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the country. They have gathered against us. Gibeon is in trouble. Gibeon is afraid. But what does he do in his fear? What is it that he does in his fear? The text says he calls upon Joshua to save him. What do you do when you have a crisis? What do you do when you have a situation that is overwhelming? What do you do when your enemies around you and within you are gathered to bring you down? What do you do? Well, friends, let me remind us that we have a Joshua in Jesus Christ. And interestingly, the name Joshua means our God who saves. Jesus means savior. We have someone like Gibeon whom we can call upon to come to our aid, to come and save us. And Gibeon did the right thing. Gibeon remembered the big brother. Gibeon remembered the covenant. And Joshua, the text says, he honored the covenant. He went. Read with me in verse 7. So Joshua went up from Gigo, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty man, men of valor. He went up. 
He went because of the covenant. He went because they had a binding covenant with Gibeon. What a covenant can do. And I'm reminded reading this text of that great covenant we have with our God through Abraham and what that great covenant can do for you and me. We are in a covenant relationship with our God. And just like Gibeon called upon Israel to come to its aid, we too can call upon God anytime to save us. He has become our savior. And the first thing that God does in this text when he shows up, verse 8. The first words he says to Joshua, which I repeat really, of Joshua chapter 1, in verse 8, he says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them. Do not fear them. You see, you have all these tribes that have made a pact. And these are not small tribes. These are tribes with trained men. Men of, of valor. Men who've been fighting and men who've been preserved for fighting. It is possible. That Israel having been drawn into this war, it is possible that Joshua was afraid. In fact, Joshua had the right to be afraid, humanly speaking. From the very beginning of this mission, Joshua had the right to be afraid. They were a small nation of untrained men if you are comparing military strength, Israel was nothing. And they were to, taught to go up against nations of trained men. They had the right to be afraid. And so it's not surprising that God constantly shows up and tells Joshua, I know exactly what's going on. I know exactly what you are up against. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, you would think that thus far, with what God has done, and thus far, with the nations that Joshua has defeated, that God would relax his assurances to Joshua. Don't be afraid. No. God keeps on reminding Joshua. God keeps on strengthening Joshua to make sure that he does not fear what must not be feared. And so God shows up with his weights. Do not fear them. Plural. Don't. Strengthen your bones. Remember the words, be strong and courageous. Do not fear them. We notice that God gives a reason for why Joshua shouldn't be afraid. He says, completing verse 8, For I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. You see, it's not enough for God to simply say, do not fear them. Well, look at all these kings that have gathered to fight. And because of our covenant with Gibeon, we've been drawn into this fight. 
It's not enough to simply say, do not fear them. God backs up that statement with a reason. He gives him a reason why he should not fear them. He says, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. In other words, God is saying to Joshua, this is a predetermined battle. The battle has already been won. Victory is secure. This is your battle. You've won. I, the Lord, have given them into your hands. That is supposed to diffuse any fear that Joshua had for these nations. Just that assurance from God that this is a predetermined battle. I know how this movie ends. You have won. I've given them into your hands. I do not know how you watch movies that you've watched before. I love soccer. And there's a difference when I'm watching a live match of Nkana versus Power Dynamos. And I don't know how it will end. And Nkana is leading by two goals to nil. And, 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 and there's like 10 minutes before the match. And Power Dynamos keeps pressing, keeps coming. I'm, I'm on the edge of the seat. In everything in me saying, come on guys, defend, defend. We are almost there, defend. We are almost there. This game is ours. There's adrenaline moving in the body. There's a fear that we may lose this game even in the dying minutes of the game. Come on, boys, let's go. We can do this. And when the game ends in favor of Unkana, uh, of course, in favor of Unkana, and everything within you, everything within you says, oh, oh, praise God, we won <laughs> this game. Now, you watch the same game on repeat. It was played last week. You are now watching it for, for, for real entertainment. And you know your team won the game. It's different. You are relaxed. Even as you watch Power Dynamos make those moves as if they are about to score, you are just, because you know they didn't score. In a sense, God is telling Joshua to relax. Because this movie has been watched before. The God of the universe knows exactly how this movie ends and how this movie goes. And he is asking Joshua to trust him. He is asking Joshua to diffuse his fears, to replace his fears with trust and confidence. He is asking Joshua to rely on God's promises. He is asking Joshua to trust the fact that the God who cannot lie has said, I have given them into your hands. Do not fear them. Now, the text tells us what Joshua does in response to those assuring words from God. Joshua has learned to trust God and observe verse 9. So Joshua came upon them suddenly. And that little word so is intended to connect us to the assuring words that God has given him. In other words, that's a form of therefore in light of this assurance, in light of these words from God, Joshua obeyed. Joshua took the corresponding action. He went up suddenly and marched to the place 
that they had been called. Friends, we have been called to trust this same God that Joshua trusted. We have been called to trust the same uh, promises that Joshua was given. That this, our God, was on our side. That this, our God, knows how the history of the world will end. He has given us Revelation, the book of Revelation, for that purpose to tell us how everything will end. He has shown us the ultimate victory is on the side of the Christians. He has shown us in Revelation that God will emerge victorious, that God will crush all his enemies. He's told us already how the movie ends. And we, like Joshua, should trust the very words of our God. We, like Joshua, should look upon the threats that come from east, west, north, and south, not with panic, but with courage and trust in our God. The church will emerge victorious. She may suffer now. She may suffer even defeat now like Joshua and the Israelites suffered defeat here and there, but the church will emerge victorious. Christ's promise to the church is that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is a solid promise written in stone, on stone. The gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. We must hurry on. You notice that God comes down to fight for his people, that his name may be feared. God comes down to fight for his people, that his name may be feared. So look at verse 10. You would expect to read about Israel, you know, battling the enemies or Gibeon battling the enemies. In fact, what is interesting in this chapter is that Gibeon is not even mentioned in the fight. They are the ones who were quoted for this fight. They call upon Joshua to come. And the author completely ignores Gibeon. They are not in the fight. I don't know if Joshua actually told the Gibeonites, you stay back and watch. They are not in the picture at all. But we also see that this, our God, is not one who is supporting from behind, who is fighting from behind. He is actually engaged in the battle. This is his battle. He is not fighting alongside Israel. He is actually in front, slaughtering his enemies. And so observe verse 10. And the Lord threw them into panic. That's these tribes who had gathered to fight the Gibeonites. And thus Israel. The Lord threw them into a panic before Israel who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Ezekiel and Makeda. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiel, and they died. How Graphic, the situation. Picture that. You've come to fight these people, and in your mind you are fighting human beings. And then stones are falling from heaven on you. What can you do with that? What can you do? Even if you were a superpower, and you had all the missiles, all the sophisticated technology, 
What can you do if stones are falling from heaven on your soldiers and your equipment? What a strong weapon, arsenal, can you bring forth to win this war? You can't. It's game over. And look, and look at how the author emphasizes this point. Verse, verse, verse 11, finishing it off. Um, they died, that's where we ended. Then he says, there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. He's basically emphasizing that the God of heaven fought this battle and killed more than Israel killed with the sword. This was the Lord's battle. That his name may be feared. He works a miracle. Observe verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. He said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. It would have been great. There's the Sunday in me saying it would have been great to witness this battle. You have hailstones falling from heaven, crushing your enemies. And then the next thing you see the sun stands still. It's supposed to go down so that it ushers in night and then the other day. But God says, uh uh, stay there until this battle is over, until the enemy has been cleared and cleared completely. Night will not come until God has executed vengeance on his enemies. And the author says this was so spectacular that it is recorded in the book of Joshua. The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. That needs to be underlined. The Lord fought for Israel. Brothers, we have a God who does not say, like some of our good brethren, I'm behind you. You go, I'm behind you. This is a God who fights for his children and on behalf of his children. I think the script sometimes tries to show that God is behind, giving the cheering and the support. And then you are in the battle, doing all the fighting. But no, if we are to learn something from this passage, it is that we serve a God who actually fights for his people. What is it that Ephesians 6 is intended to tell us. When you look at all the spiritual armor portrayed in Ephesians 6, you actually come to the conclusion that this battle that we are engaged in is the Lord's. And the weapons that are given to us there are the Lord's. And success ultimately is coming because God fights for you. And all he asks from us, just like he asked from Joshua, is that we obey. So for example, when he says, put on the full armor of God, you obey that. That's an instruction. Put on. And when you do, God will fight for you. But to wrap up this interesting passage, we observe that the five Amorite kings 
after they observe how their soldiers were slaughtered, after they saw everything that happened, hailstones coming, killing the people or the soldiers, the five Amorite kings fled. And may I mention one thing, dear friends, that this passage is also intended to show Gibeon and these tribes and this king Adonai to show him that Israel was not alone. Joshua was not alone. There was a God behind Joshua. I do not think that even Gibeon had gotten that memo yet. I don't think King Adonai had gotten that memo yet. Up until this stage, they were thinking, well, this is a small army, yes, but with very tactical, sophisticated way of fighting. God is not in the picture. And so these miracles that were worked in this place where Gibeon was being fought, they underlined one thing. A message was at least sent that you are fighting a nation whose God fights for them. So the five Amorites kings have now fled. That's what verse 16 says. These five kings fled and hid themselves. Again, what is happening? They are fear. And they are rightly afraid. They are afraid of the person they should be afraid of. They hide. And what the story says is that Joshua simply says, can you close? They were hiding in caves. Can you close the mouths of the caves so that those people do not come out. But let me quickly take you to the ending of this chapter. Eventually, Joshua says, can you bring them out? Verse 25 or 24 for a bit of context. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near. Put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. 25. And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed. I like this. In the beginning of the chapter and in the beginning of the book, who was being taught these very words? Do not fear, do not be afraid. Joshua. God was speaking these words to Joshua. But in the conclusion, it is Joshua who is now telling these very words to his men. He's repeating God's words to them. The same way that he was strengthened by God is now strengthening his soldiers. The same lesson he learned is now giving it to his soldiers. And bringing these kings... He is giving them a picture lesson. These are the people we were afraid of. These are the mighty armies of the known world. Look at what you are doing to them. Your legs are on their necks. What's the lesson? Do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. These are the very words God told Joshua. Joshua has learned the lesson very well is able to teach it. And after that, they are executed. And the battle is over. But the lesson is not over. What Joshua wanted to emphasize to his men is that we have more of these battles to come as we shall observe next Thursday and the other Thursdays. The land still needs to be conquered. Nations need to be fought. And it is going to be very important that you diffuse your fear with trust in God. It's going to be important that you learn who you must fear. 
If there's anyone who needs to be feared in the passage we have read today, it is God and God alone. Not anyone. The five kings, Adonai, should have feared the Lord. Gibeon should fear the Lord. Israel should fear the Lord. The fear of man, we are told in Proverbs, leads to a snare. What do you fear? You see, the fear of man brings us into despising God and disobeying God. Because when you fear man and not God, you are choosing to disregard what God has said because to you, man is so powerful. You are elevating man above God. You are despising God. That fear should be redirected to God. When God says, do not fear, do not fear. Trust, obey, and be courageous. It's not us fighting for God. It is God fighting for us. Let's not get that twisted. To you who has not called upon God, is this the kind of God you want to be fighting all your life? I mean, what do you do when you're dealing with such a God? What do you do? There's only one action. Surrender. Surrender and give your life to him. Save him. You cannot win against this, our God. That's why he calls us to call upon him. He calls us to surrender, to throw our weapons and to trust only in him. May we fear our God and nothing else. Amen. Let me quickly dismiss us in prayer. Let me ask you to stand as we pray. Dear God, we pray that you may wake in us that fear of thee that reverences your name, that fears to do wicked things, that fear that seeks to honor your name, that fear that reveres your holiness, that fear that acknowledges you as the only sovereign. And in this way, may we glorify your name before the nations. May we spread the honors of your name to all the nations. May we be known as a people who fear God. May our churches be filled with the fear of the Lord and may you work wonders because your name is honored among us. And now as we progress through the activities of the day, may you strengthen us for the sake of your name. Amen. Thank you. We are dismissed for classes.